Hello, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, I normally do this presentation with seventh grade, so oftentimes that's the first time I'll meet people. My wife, Kelly, does fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and I do seventh through twelfth graders. Um, if you're not in seventh grade, that's not meant to, like, it's not inappropriate for you to see this intro. I've done it for people as old as seniors in high school. But typically, when I start this presentation, I'll be working most of the time with seventh graders. And oftentimes, when I walk into the school, I often do presentations live. I'll be with the students, and I'm standing in front of the room with the administrators or teachers and students start walking in and it's kind of interesting to see how they kind of they think I like can't hear so the students will walk past me and they'll be like oh dude why do we even have to do this stupid class like I know more about this stuff than that old guy possibly can I'll teach him stuff about this topic and I'm like uh <laughs> I'm standing right here so ultimately, it's kind of interesting to see how people process this entire offering. But in schools, a lot of times, that's mostly what you have to do is when you're told to do something like seventh grade is going to do drug ed, you're kind of stuck and you have to do it whether you want to or not. Another place a lot of people get drug education that they don't necessarily ask for is from their parents. Now, here's the problem. If you ask students in America, do your parents do drug education with you at home? Fewer than 30 percent of them will say yes. If you, however, ask their parents the same question, more than 70% of them say they're doing it. And unfortunately, parents have often been stuck in kind of the old anti-drug tropes, these old things that are really kind of dysfunctional and very essentially disdained by the greater community. Like there were noble efforts back then, but sometimes now they become jokes or memes. But basically, when you are teaching drug education to your kid, most parents tell us they don't really have the confidence to do what they're trying to do. And so often they'll end up saying things like, drugs are bad, don't do them. And that's a really simplistic conclusion to reach because here's the problem. When you're in seventh grade, you probably understand drugs are bad. Your parents don't mean drugs, all drugs. They mean drugs of abuse. Here's the thing though, just four short years ago, when you're three short years ago, if you're in seventh grade, when you were in fourth grade, you were very definitively not an, ab an abstract thinker. You could not infer meaning from words that were not clearly stated. So if a parent said something like drugs are bad to a fourth grader, that means all drugs are bad. So imagine a fourth grader playing soccer on the soccer field. They start to have a little bit of an asthma attack and they think, OK, I should probably use my inhaler so I can breathe better. But here's the problem. What's the inhaler actually contain? Well, it contains drugs and drugs are what? drugs are bad. So now we've got this kid terrified of his own medicine. So drugs are bad. Uh, we just killed a fourth grader. <laughs> That's not where I think we wanted this to go. And so ultimately, we kind of were stuck with the idea of how do you project this information well and adequately and have it be received by the people you're aiming it at? So it's really important to understand this is hard to do. It's hard for parents to do. It's hard for schools to do. But here's the other thing you get. You, you also get from a third place. You get drug education you don't ask for through the media. So you get it from school, you get it from your parents, and you get it from the media. Now, here's the thing. When you're talking about anti-drug ads through the media, you have to understand they're trying to, they can't just come in and tell you what to do. Like people your age tend to resent older people who come in and say, here's what to do. You kids don't do drugs, okay? Hey, shut it, fool. Get away from me. Who do you think you're talking to? You don't even know me. So when you have an anti-drug ad, first of all, who are they aimed at? Like what, what age cohort are they aimed at? They're aimed at you guys. They're aimed at middle schoolers, they're aimed at high schoolers, they're aimed at young adults and adolescents, basically who don't like being told what to do by somebody they don't know. So what they are forced to do in these anti-drug ads is they're forced to basically kind of like tell you a story or employ the use of metaphor or analogy, kind of like getting you to a conclusion that you feel as though you made that they didn't tell you to think, okay? So they're gonna lead you to this end conclusion. Here's the problem, that's really hard, especially if you don't have well-adapted abstract thinking skills, the ability to infer meaning from words that are not clearly stated. So when you see an anti-drug ad, sometimes they're really hard to understand the message. I always ask my students, have you ever seen an anti-drug ad you don't understand? And almost all of them are willing to admit, yeah, some of them are really obtuse. Some of them are really tangential. I don't know what it is they're trying to say. So watch this one, watch this anti-drug ad and tell me at the end, if you can, what you think this ad was trying to communicate to you. Okay, I'm heading out. All right, guys, be good.
Hey Mike, what's up? Uh, who is that? Okay, so when we watch that ad, most of the time when I ask my class, okay, who's really brave? Who wants to tell me what that ad means, what it represents? And sometimes somebody raised their hand. I'm like, now listen, my goal is not to shame you. My goal is not to make fun of you. What does that ad represent? They're like, okay, so here's the thing. The cats, they're teenagers, right? And when you leave them at home alone, sometimes teenagers will have parties that get out of control, even if they don't intend them to. So the cats are teenagers left unsponsored or unsupervised. They're gonna have parties. Sometimes there's drinking involved, sometimes drugs involved. It's basically, and don't leave your teenagers alone video. And that's really normal. That would be expected from that video content. But here's the thing. That's not what it's about. Now, there's a couple of clues here, okay? Truth.com. Truth does almost one thing exclusively, and that's their anti-smoking and their anti-vaping. There's a couple of other hints in there. It said before on the slide right before this one, it said, prevent cat Mageddon, save the cat videos. So basically what they're saying is this, okay? This was an anti-smoking advertisement. Yeah, I know. It doesn't really, not many people actually get that. Because here's what they're saying. They're saying, if you smoke in the presence of your cat, your cat will die at a higher rate. If you like cat videos, like the one we just showed you, don't smoke around your cat. Um, okay. Well, was the ad funny? I think it's very funny. I think it's very, was it relatively well-made? Come on, dancing cats, how can you not love that? So here's the problem. Did it communicate its anti-smoking message effectively? No, no one gets that from this video. Nobody can actually ferret out the true meaning of what they're saying. So it's really funny and it's really well made, but it doesn't get the job done. Now, some of the ads, like a lot of ads struggle with this. Like now watch this next one. What I want you to do, go back in your mind, okay, to your fourth grade self. Watch this ad as though you're still in fourth grade. Tell me the takeaway for the average fourth grader after watching this ad. Okay, so if you smoke weed, what happens? Uh, E.T. steals your chick. <laughs> now, here's the thing. What that would presuppose is that if you're showing that to a fourth grader, that they will, what's, what are they going to conclude after that? Okay, I don't have a significant romantic other. And if you do, fourth graders don't date, okay? If you're dating in fourth grade, you need new parents because yours aren't doing the job, okay? Here's the thing. Fourth graders, they might have friends, but they don't date exclusively. You're not Ubering to Blaze Pizza with your main squeeze on a Wednesday night in fourth grade. So here's the thing. A fourth grader not having the loss of the significant romantic interest the ad threatens them with is basically like, okay, well, I don't lose anything if I smoke weed. So a half an hour later, you got a bunch of fourth graders in their bedroom <laughs> bonging their little butts off. And you're like, what are you doing? Oh, the ad said it was okay. I don't have a, I don't have a girlfriend. That's not what it said. Get over here. We got to talk. Now here's the, now please, I understand that ad does not make fourth graders smoke weed. That's incredibly hyperbolic. And yeah, this is hard to communicate what you're trying to communicate, okay? Now this next one, some of these companies just get really frustrated like, all right, we can't do the ad, we can't do the storytelling, let's just go right at it, okay? So they start off with a direct question, okay? This one starts off really strong. When others ask you to do drugs, what do you say to them? So when others ask you to do drugs, what should you say to them? Well, everybody has a response of some sort or another. Here's what the ad says you should say, okay? Here's their suggested response. I'd rather stick a trophies in my ears. Now, in case you didn't hear what he just said, you can't believe what you just heard. He said, if somebody were to offer me drugs, I would tell them I'd rather stick anchovies in my ears. Yeah. Try that one on when you get to high school. Go to your first big kid party. You walk in the door and somebody's like, dude, get over here. You want to drink? You want to smoke some weed with us? And your answer is, I would rather stick anchovies in my ears than take your drugs, sir. <laughs> I hope you realize what you just did, okay? You just burned yourself to the ground. It's over for you. Your, suicide, your, your social life just ended, okay? Here's the thing. This ad is supposed to teach you how to resist offers of drugs. What it actually teaches you how to do is pitch yourself into a bottomless pit of self-induced shame.
Not only is it not helpful, it's directly detrimental to your well-being and success rates if you follow these suggestions. Now, here's the problem that you currently face, okay? In seventh grade, I would hope most of you have not had to deal with this yet. But if you have, I feel sorry for you, but you will eventually have to deal with this. At some point, somebody's going to offer you drugs or alcohol. And at that point, you have to realize this. There's only two answers. You can say yes, and you can say no. That's it. Now, here's the other confounding factor, okay? Most of the time, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says this. More than 70% of teen drug and alcohol use occurs at parties. So if you're going to be drinking, if you're going to be using, you're going to be doing it at a party. Now, here's the other problem. Who gets invited to parties? What kind of people get invited to parties? Cool, popular people get invited to parties. In our heart of hearts, do most of us want those people to at least acknowledge our right to be there, acknowledge our existence, let us in? Do we want to be accepted by the greater group? Yeah. Now, not everybody hews to that, but really it's important to understand. Human beings are designed to join groups. When we do so, in the past, we survived at higher rates. Joiners survived at higher rates. Because of that, the more likely progeny they were going to have would be joiners as well. So basically, the genetics have determined that we join groups because it's survivability. It increases survivability. That's important. So we are destined by our DNA to want to join the group. Now, here's the other thing. We all understand the dynamics of group involvement. How do you get a greater group to accept you? Do what they're doing. If you want to hang around with surfers, don't bring your violin to the beach. They'll be like, who's the freak with the fiddle? Like, there's nothing wrong with playing the violin. You know that. It's incredibly gifted people who play the violin, but it doesn't belong in that context per se. It's important to note, you don't fit in right then. So here's the problem. If you want to fit in with a greater group, which some of the members are smoking weed and some of the members are drinking, your brain immediately leaps to this conclusion. Those are the things I should do. They're the most easily observable, easily repeatable behaviors that gain you group acceptance, and you don't question them in that moment. The pressure is too great. The social need is too great. And ultimately, if you spend a lot of time around who, people who drink and smoke weed, you're going to do those things that are at a higher rate, whether you initially intended to or not. If you don't do this, okay, here's the goal of this opening presentation. We want you at the end of this experience to start thinking about these things, okay? Who am I? What do I want? How am I going to get that job done? I can't tell you whether to use or not use or drink or not drink. Now, I don't want you to, but it's not my right to tell you how to behave. What I want you to do is understand this. After you see the stuff that we present over the next couple of years, you'll understand this. People that start at a really early age involve themselves in unbelievably high risk for future problems with substance use issues in their life. So starting now is a really, really difficult thing to live out the reality of in your adult life. So I'd rather you not. But that's your choice. But you have to explore the notion, who am I? What do I want? How am I going to get there? Now, most people are looking at me like, why don't you just tell us what to say? Because I can't. I don't have that ability because it has to be you answering. It has to pertain to you particularly. And so basically, like if you play soccer really well at a club level, your parents spend the entire weekend schlepping you around the state so you can kick a ball. If you're really engaged, you want to get a scholarship to college to play soccer, you want to play for LAFC or the Galaxy, you're really into it. You can say when somebody says, dude, you want to smoke some weed? You're like, I can't. You know that. That's going to mess up my lungs. It's going to totally get infected. It's going to impact my outcomes in the future. No, I don't want to do that. You know better than that. So that would be believed by your friends. If all you do instead is sit inside playing Fortnite 24 hours a day and you go to a party and somebody says, you want to smoke some weed? And you're like, no, I can't. It'll mess up my soccer career. They'll be looking at you like, what are you talking about? Did you get FIFA 21? I mean, seriously, you don't play soccer except on video games. So what are you talking about? It doesn't apply to you. I can only give you a couple of suggestions maybe that might help you. Like um, somebody offers you drugs or alcohol and you say, no, thank you. I'm good. And then find someplace else to be. No, thank you. You're being polite. You're not being confrontational. You're not name calling. I'm good. I'm not judging what you're doing. You just do what you do. I'll do what I do. I'm good, though. And then find someplace else to be. Because again, if you spend a lot of time around people who drink and smoke weed, you're going to do those things at a higher rate whether you intended to or not. So that's the initial opening thing that we want to get to is the idea you got to start making decisions now because later when you don't make them, if you're stuck at a party and somebody offers you a drink and this is the first time you think about this, you're going to be the victim of the moment because the pressure will be too great. You won't have an answer and you'll end up doing those things at a higher rate.
Now, another thing people ask me when, when we talk about drug education and why I do it is um, the idea, how did you get into this? How did you become a drug educator? I've been doing this for 26 years now. And ultimately, as an adult, me as an adult has a lot to do with who I was as a kid. And if you look at me as a kid, I'm a really cute kid. Look at me on my rented pony over here. I'm a cutie, right? Now, here's the thing. As far as my mental health was concerned, there were questions. <laughs> but I don't know what the three-year-old madman is doing right here. But here's, here's the other thing. A lot of people who they become as adults has a lot to do with their parents. Now, my parents, super important to me, obviously. My mom was a nurse. My dad was a naval officer. That's not her nurse's outfit. That's her wedding gown. But basically, my dad was a naval officer. My dad was a really big deal as far as my life was concerned. Because here's what my dad did. He wasn't just a naval officer. He was the commander of what are called nuclear submarines. Now, when you look at this is one of the subs my dad was actually in command of. This is one of the things he was in charge of. And if you look at this paragraph of top, it says, these fearful underwater giants stay hidden in the oceans, avoiding detection at all costs, and are always ready for the moment they might be needed. Now, what's the moment they might be needed? Well, that would be called World War III. Basically, if you launch the weapons contained in the submarine, they're nuclear warhead-tipped missiles. If you start lobbing nukes around, you've really gotten into a serious confrontation with another country. That this, you, this submarine here could kill millions of people. That was my dad's job. Make this thing threatening to the enemy. Now, the enemy, of course, wanted this sub destroyed. So when my dad went to work, here was his job. Take that submarine, park it off the coast of Russia, and don't get caught. Don't get found out. Because if we need you, you got to be ready to launch those missiles, and you can't get caught. Because if you get caught, they're going to hold you hostage. They're going to destroy the submarine. They want this thing gone. So my dad's job when he went to work was to hide. Now, hiding entailed this. Don't get found out, which means don't communicate with the outside world. When this sub goes under the, under the surface of the sea, it doesn't have to come up for months. They literally make their own oxygen. They don't have to come up at all. They stay down hidden for long periods of time. So when my dad went to work, like one morning he'd go to work and we'd be like, oh man, dad's leaving. He'd be gone for three months. And I miss him desperately. I really got sad when my dad had to go because I knew he wasn't coming home for three months. Then he'd, come, then he'd come home and he'd stay home for three months and then he had to go back. So he'd be home for three months, gone for three months, home for three months, gone for three months. And it was repetitive heartbreak over long periods of time. And for half my life, my dad might as well have been in space as to be in that submarine. He was gone from my life. But the other thing about living in a military family is you move all the time. By the time I was 19 years old, I lived in 17 different houses. That's a lot of moving, okay? And it's not comfortable to be the new kid all the time where you come into an established social structure and you got to find a way into that social structure quickly. Now, what's one of the things? Now, remember how to join large groups do what the group is doing. What's an easily observable and repeatable behavior that the group is doing? Well, sports, obviously, but here's the problem. I wasn't very good at sports. And so ultimately I didn't have that out. What else I could do though? Other easily observable behaviors for me were, what substance are they using? So who's smoking? I started smoking cigarettes when I was eight years old. I started drinking when I was 12. I started smoking weed when I was 14 years old. Now, you might be horrified by the thought of a third grader smoking, and you should be, but this was the 1960s. About 40-something percent of American adults smoked at the time. Now it's down below 13%. But at the time, almost half of American adulthood in this country smoked. Cigarettes were everywhere. It was ubiquitous, and they were easy to get. So a lot of kids smoked back then, and I did it not because I desired tobacco in my life, because I wanted friends. I wasn't trying to get drunk when I drank. I was trying to socialize. I wasn't trying to get high when I smoked weed. I was trying to fit in with my older brother and his friends. And so ultimately, my socialization skills led me to substance use at very early ages, which we have seen is incredibly problematic. So the other thing about this picture, okay, I'm 14 years old. At this age, all of us are going through puberty, right? We're deep into puberty. You know, when you grow to full adult size, here's the problem. You don't grow to full adult size proportionally. It's like one body part at a time. So my feet said, okay, my brain said, okay, feet, go. Look at my feet. Look how monstrously big my feet are. Anybody who has the big feet knows that this is not something that's really, really graceful at this age. All you can do is kick chairs and trip in front of people. It's like, hey, Frankenstein, pick your books up. Let's go. It's like, okay. So here's the other thing. So I'm going through puberty. I got the big feet. But here's the other thing I have. 
90% of American males by the time they are 13 have a fully realized adult male voice box. By 14, we all do. Except here's the problem. We're driving these great new deep voices with a 13-year-old brain. And so ultimately, if you're like at a seventh grade dance and you wander over to some girl and you're like, hey, baby, you want to... uh <laughs> and right when you need your voice to be as low as possible, you sound like Casper on steroids. And it's really embarrassing. So I had the big feet. I had the really impossible voice. And at the age of 13, my head was the size of an orange. My nose was the size of a banana. I had this monstrous nose hang on to the front of my face. And I was so incredibly self-conscious of my nose. Here's the problem, though. A reality check would insist it's actually not that big. But when I looked in the mirror, this is what I saw. So at the age of 13, I've got this incredible subconsciousness about my appearance and my dad cutting my hair as a naval officer. He would cut my hair so short. Back in the 60s, when I was growing up, hair down to the middle of your back was cool. I looked, I looked like I was joining the Marines. It was really not cool. And what's the last indignity our faces suffer at the age of 13? Yeah, acne. And I didn't want my zits to be lonely, so I grew a whole crop of them, okay? So you got this tiny little bald-headed, big-nosed, zit-faced, funny voice, duck-footed loser. How do you think I did socially? Yeah, how well. I couldn't ask a girl to dance if you, if you threatened me with violence. It'd be like, ask her to dance or I'll punch you in the face. And I guess I better learn how to take a punch then, because I'm not going to ask her to dance. I'm terrified of her. What does this have to do with drugs and alcohol? Well, I show up at a party. I'm like 12 years old. And we realized after looking around the room for a little while that there's no adults here. There's nobody overseeing us. Nobody is supervising us. In the corner, there's a refrigerator stuffed full of beer. If we want to break enough rules and take enough risk, we can steal some of that beer, which we did. Two of my friends and I stole a six-pack of Budweiser. We snuck it into the garage. We each drank two beers. Now, was two beers a huge dose of alcohol? Not really. Is it a meaningful dose for a 12-year-old who's never had a drink before? Yeah, obviously. Here's the thing about alcohol. It's a very predictable drug. It undoes brain functions in a predictable order. The first thing alcohol removes from the human brain is fear. Alcohol has a nickname. It's called liquid courage. When you drink it, you lose your fear. So I drank I had two beers. I had two doses of alcohol in my body. For the first time in my life, I can ask a girl to dance without dying of a heart attack. And I did. She said yes. So basically, what was alcohol to me in that moment? It was a magic potion. It made me happy. It made me successful. It gave me what I wanted. It socialized me. D does that sound like something you should be saying in seventh grade or eighth grade drug ed? Hey, if you guys feel social anxiety like I did, just get hammered. It goes away. That's not really what I'm trying to convey here, okay? Here's the important part. When I drank alcohol, it removed from me some self-controls or some limitations that I could have gotten past naturally had I learned some skill sets, had I learned how to socialize over time. But the problem with human brains is this. We're like water. We follow the path of least resistance. When you show a human brain an easy way to get a really hard job done, it's not going to go back and do it the old hard way again. Did I drink the second time I had the chance to? Of course, because it works so well the first time. Here's the problem you face when you use a substance as a teenager. Oftentimes, the first re re feedback you get appears positive. It seems as though, hey, look what this did for me. Look what I got from this. And it seems like it's a reward. Actually, here's what's going on. Because you don't return to the old skill building way, you don't go back to the hard way, your new coping skill in social situations becomes alcohol. As you use it over the ensuing years, you lose the ability to do the job other ways. In other words, you don't build a skill set. Ultimately, when I checked out of drug treatment for the first time at the age of 30, I had never asked a girl to dance sober in my life. I didn't need to. I had alcohol. So ultimately, not only did, was it not my friend, it forced me into a dependent relationship upon it, which then allowed me to become much more problematic around my use of alcohol as an adult. Here's the problem. Use as a teenager pre-stages addiction rates or alcoholism rates, essentially substance use disorders around alcohol in an incredibly high rate. It builds the future for you. Ultimately, not everyone who drinks as a teenager becomes an alcohol use disorder victim, but where we get the alcohol use disorder victims from is that population. Nine out of every 10 people who are using drugs addictively or drinking alcohol alcoholically, in other words, on the substance use disorder spectrum, come from that population.
So using it at an early age entails great risk for future problems. I didn't know that though, because I was just socializing. So ultimately I start off using in ways which seemed functional, which ultimately created dependencies. And so remember the cute kid that we were talking about before? Here's me. By the time I was 17 years old, by the time I was a junior in high school, I didn't look the same anymore. That's me in the background right there with the cigarette dangling out of my face. And when you first see this picture, it's really tempting to think, wow, what a pack of thugs, what a bunch of punks. But actually, when you look at this picture, this picture is kind of misleading because when this picture was taken, I was getting really good grades in high school. I was on the track team as a pole vaulter. I had a full-time job after school and on weekends. I got out of school at 1245 in the afternoon, went to work at the Army Air Force Exchange System at Belvoir, Fort Belvoir in Virginia. I worked full-time because I wanted stuff. Now, the one thing I really wanted was a car. And so I ultimately bought this car. This is my car in high school. Really cool Triumph GTC Mark, GT6 Mark III. It was really cool car. And ultimately, it was one of the coolest cars in my whole high school. It was cool to have. But I also, on the way to high school, in my beautiful car, picked up my, my beautiful girlfriend, Marcy. I got accepted to every college I applied to, and my mom loved me. So when you look at this picture, you might be misled because I'm really actually a very functional, very accomplished, relatively successful student, but... See that cigarette dangling out of my face? I've been smoking at this point, the picture was taken, nine years. I've been drinking for five years. I've been smoking weed for three. But if you came to me right here in this moment and said to me, hey, you know what? You should stop using drugs. They're really bad for you. They're going to hurt you. I'd be like, would I listen to you? No. Why not? It's really important to nail this down. Why would I not believe you when you told me this is really bad for you? Well, because my point would be this. Show me prove it. Make me realize what you mean when they're bad for me. Which part of my life is most uncomfortable for you? Is it my good grades or my athleticism? Is it my nice car or my beautiful girlfriend? Is it my college acceptances or my family or my family love? Which part messes you up the most? Which part should I be most afraid of? Here's the problem. Most teenagers who start using do not see the detrimental costs of their use at that point until years and sometimes decades later. Using at this age pre-stages adult problems with drugs, not teenage problems with drugs. Now, some teenagers can be egregiously and acutely hurt, but most of them think they're getting away with it. And that's the really dysfunctional message of teenage use. It seems not to be hurting the user unless, of course, they get caught. And here's the thing. You can't talk me out of doing this because you don't seem to have any proof or any evidence. How about a couple of years later? This is me as a freshman in college, okay? First semester, freshman year. Look at me standing here, beer in one hand, cigarette in the other. Basically, look at my face, though, and tell me you're going to talk that guy out of drinking more. No, because I'm having too much fun with all my new buddies in college. Now, how about four years later, okay? Because this is me as a freshman. Four years later, I didn't fail out of college, okay? I got kicked out of college. Now, I need you to understand how hard it is to get kicked out of college because you pay your tuition. And after that, if you can maintain a minimal grade level average, they're just not going to bother with you. They don't follow you around. They don't make you go to class unless you decide to go to class. There might be some costs associated with not going. But basically, if you can maintain a minimal grade average, they don't care. But for me, it was a little different. They cared because I was dealing drugs at that point. I'm basically, I don't even go to class anymore. I'm just going to college so I can sell drugs to college students. It was really dysfunctional. And they said, you need to go away. Okay, you're not welcome here anymore. So I got kicked out of college. So I had to get a job, right? I'm, I, don't, I can't go home. So I got a job. I got this, this job at this really cool restaurant. This is called the Rockingham Hotel in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. This is a really cool old building. Inside is this beautiful restaurant called the Library Restaurant. And it's a really high-end fine dining restaurant restaurant, got a job right out of college and right waiting tables. And we made a bunch of money here. Not only do we make a bunch of money, I got two free drinks after every shift. I was with all of my peers and my pals and my buddies were partying really hard. And I think I've got this whole thing made, right? Failing out of college was no consequence to me. Well, except for the fact that I didn't get a degree, that was a little bit of an immature decision. I didn't graduate from college until I was 62 years old. So yeah, super expensive, but I didn't know it at the time. So basically, here's me. Now, here's the thing. I waited on two people from a Fortune 500 company, and they said, you know what? Your personality matches exactly the people we want aren't working for our company. Would you like a job? And I'm like, well, it depends. I mean, can I make any money? And they're like, you're going to be shocked at how much money you can make if you work for our company. So I took the job and they were right. I was really good at it. I was one year, I was the number 12 salesman out of 5,000 for the company. So I was making a bunch of money back in the 70s and early, back in the 80s, I was making like a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. I had a brand new house, two new cars, married my college sweetheart. And on the outside, I looked like the American success story. On the inside though, 
what do you get when you give a kid like me who started using when he was really young a bunch of money? My substance use issues are so deep seated at that point that the money offered me a brand new way to hurt myself. I basically, this was the eighties now. Okay. That's the cocaine era. I became addicted to cocaine. So I'm addicted to cocaine, to tobacco, to marijuana, and to alcohol and all of these things. By the time I was 30 years old, I was dying, not just poetically speaking, not metaphorically speaking, dying. If I don't check into rehab, I die. And so my company actually paid to put me into rehab. I went to McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts. It's a Harvard Associated uh, Medical School. And basically what you have here, a hospital, I mean, and basically what you have here on the second floor of this building is called East House. East House was the drug treatment unit at, Bel at McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts. So I checked in to this really high-end drug treatment unit, and they said, here's why you use like you do. Here's why you fail every time you try and stop on your own. Here's a couple of things you might want to try. They're going to, they'll be the only way you're going to stay alive. They're going to save my life by telling me these things. Okay. Ultimately, the only way I survive is to follow their suggestions. And I did to the best of my ability. And I failed a couple of times, but I basically got back on. And that's the reason I get to do what I do today, because these guys taught me what I needed to stay alive. I didn't ask them for the information. They willingly gave it. Well, after $28,000, they gave it to me. But ultimately, I learned how to survive here. It's why I do what I do, because the information was, it was basically, it saved me from my own ignorance. So that's why I do drug education. Now, my wife, Kelly, my business partner, we met because of this unbelievable series of coincidences. Okay, so first of all, Kelly and I were born in exactly the same city. We were born on the same street, about less than a mile away from each other, two separate hospitals, less than a mile away from each other. We started our lives on the same city block. Now, Kelly and I didn't meet until I was 39 years old. So four decades passed between the time we're born on the same street and the time that we first meet. But our lives were exactly the same. We both moved to California for elementary school. We both went to elementary school in California. For high school, we both moved all the way back to Northern Virginia. We went to high school so close to each other. My high school sports teams used to compete against Kelly's high school sports teams. So Groveton versus West Springfield. I'm on the Groveton side. Kelly's on the West Springfield side. We're literally looking at each other across a basketball court, but we don't even know we're there. We won't meet for 22 more years. Our fathers had exactly the same jobs. They were both in the Navy, both on nuclear submarines, both stationed in the same ports at the same time. We think our fathers actually walked past each other at work, never met until the day of our wedding. Both of our fathers were born on exactly the same day. It's like, nee, 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 nee. this is like the twilight zone. We were so freaked out when we first met because each of us was telling the other's life story, not knowing that we were just speaking about ourselves. We were like, why well, did you know that about me? I, I don't. I'm talking about me. No, you're describing my life. And so Kelly and I had these unbelievably weird coincidences in our lives. It doesn't mean, though, that we're irredeemable weirdos. Like, I don't belong in the zoo. We had relatively normal childhood upbringings. Let me show you what I mean. How many of you guys have a bunch of pictures of you that have been taken over the years that you find relatively embarrassing? <laughs> How many of you have the parents who like to share those pictures with everyone? And I know a lot of you are like, yeah, that's really embarrassing. Now, here's the thing. Kelly and I had that in common as well. Here are the pictures our parents used to share with the world. By the way, apologies, okay? Um, this is me. Now, to answer the question, which is currently floating around in most of your heads, I, I don't know. I was four. I don't know why I didn't pull my pants up until after I was done brushing my teeth that day. But my parents got great mirth and great glee out of the fact that I was a complete blivet at the age of four and couldn't pull my own pants up. Here's Kelly over here doing her Victoria's Secret pose down at the age of three. So we have the embarrassing butt photos in common as well, as I'm sure many of you do. Now, that's just a bunch of coincidences, though. The next one is going to freak you out. Kelly and I had so much in common. We were both in the Girl Scouts. Look at Kelly. She's like depresso scout, whatever. Look at me. Woohoo! Cookies for everybody. Where are the Thin Mints? Actually, I wasn't a Girl Scout in reality. I was a Girl Scout for Halloween one year. Great Halloween costume, by the way. But I was in Boy Scout. So we had scouting in common as well. So we had all these things in common. One thing we did not have in common was I was the last generation of American youth that did not get drug education in school. Kelly was the first generation that did. See, we're about six years apart in age. Kelly was the first group of students in America to get drug education in school. And they started in fifth grade. Look how young Kelly is in fifth grade. She looks so, so incredibly young. And they're going to do drug education with these little kids? Well, yeah, because here's the thing. Studies show 
that most important messages about drug education should be delivered when kids are the young. You should start talking to kids in third, fourth, and fifth grades. It's really important to have these conversations before they decide to start using. So they have these fifth graders, and basically, now back then, they did not have the luxury of PowerPoint. If you're going to do a drug presentation back in the 60s and early 70s, uh, yeah, it was, I guess it was about the 60s. Basically, you're going to have to go in live. So Kelly's like 11 years old. She, yeah, this is the early 70s. So they're basically coming into the classroom. They walk in to the science class, right? And they're carrying these three huge jars, okay? And they're carrying the jars. Now, everybody's fascinated by what's in the jars, but they can't see inside them because they have these covers over them. And I'm not talking small jars. I'm not talking pickle jars or mayonnaise jars. I'm talking biological sample jars, okay? And so they come in with these big jars and they plop them on the table and they start talking. At a really dramatic moment in their presentation, they unveil the contents of the first jar. And floating in the first jar is a human lung. Not, not a picture like you see here, not a, an acrylic model like you might have in your biology class. This is a human organ floating in juice. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, these things, are, they, the first question would be, is this a good lung or a bad lung? And almost everybody sees like the blackening over here and the big crease running through them. And then, and then this thing with a bullet hole or whatever that is, basically people see this lung and they're like, oh God, get that thing off the screen. That's horrifying. Actually, this is a fabulously healthy human lung. Well, besides the fact that it's outside the person's body, yeah, that's a bit of a problem. But when they cut this person's chest open during the autopsy and they were like, oh, those are gorgeous lungs. Here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to chop those things out of there, stick them in jars, and show them to fifth graders. Uh, why? Well, because we don't want them to smoke. Isn't it obvious? Well, no. Why would you show them a healthy lung if you don't want them to smoke? Well, you probably have figured out why, because there's two more jars. The first jar is the baseline. That's the healthy lung. In the other two jars, you can only imagine what awaits you, right? When they unveiled the contents of the second jar, it was floating this thing. Now, in case you haven't caught on yet, let me do a quick lung primer, okay? Good lung, bad lung, good lung. When you look at this, it's stained the color of chocolate. Over here underneath the Matterhorn, it looks like somebody spilled ink on it. Down here, this is not the weather channel. That's not a hurricane about to slam Louisiana for the seventh time in August. Basically, that's a cancerous tumor. The person with this lung died of a cancerous tumor. Now, the question I asked my class in my class at this point is, are you a little less likely to smoke right now than you were 60 seconds ago? Yeah. This is terrifying stuff. I have students who saw this long in my class in seventh grade. They've grown up. They graduated from college. They have children of their own. And if I see them in the supermarket, they come over to me and go, that black lung haunts my dreams. <laughs> the black lung is something you have difficulty forgetting. And so basically, yeah, they seem to be really scary. But it doesn't even get scary until the third jar gets unveiled. Because in the third jar is this thing. Now, it started, that's a human lung, by the way. It started out looking like this and ended up looking like this for one reason, one reason only, cigarette smoke. And we have to understand how dramatically impactful this is because basically when you see this lung, you're seeing a lung infected, impacted by end-stage emphysema. And so ultimately, these bubbles and these unbelievable failures in the lungs are something that we have to really be concerned with. And here's the other thing. People have trouble discerning what it would be like to live with these lungs, just imagining. Let me show you. Here's a guy with these lungs trying to breathe. Let me, 33 seconds of this, okay? Just listen for 33 seconds. And that seems a lot longer than 33 seconds, doesn't it? When that tape ends, okay, when they turn off the cameras and microphones, here's what I want you to understand. That wasn't an attack. That's how he lives. That's his whole day. And you notice that when you're, you're still watching the ad, they said, People who die from smoking rarely die quickly and never do they die painlessly. And when you watch that guy struggle to breathe and realize he'll never get better, it's terrifying. So I always ask the class at this point, are you less likely to smoke than you were five minutes ago? And they're like, yeah. Well, here's the thing. When they showed these lungs in the classroom back in the 70s, when Kelly was in fifth grade, the kids were terrified. And Kelly and her two best friends, Laura and Colleen, they were so afraid of these lungs 
that they basically formed an anti-smoking pact. Before they even took the lungs out of the classroom, these three little girls are like, I am not going to be the victim of that, nor, nor neither are you. We're going to not smoke, you guys. We'll support each other. We're going to get this job done, okay? Now, the people doing the presentation, they saw that. And they were like, look what we just did. We just created drug education that works. All you have to do is terrify a bunch of fifth graders, okay? And they gave birth to a type of drug education called scare tactics. And scare tactics, now here's the thing. Scare tactics can be employed successfully in drug education if you do them occasionally and you do them perfectly and you can't, you can't vary. You can't miss one box, okay? Now, you do them occasionally and you have to do them perfectly. What are some of the parameters of doing them perfectly? It has to be true. Well, this is true. It has to be scary really scary. Then you have to provide an off-ramp, an escape hatch, how to avoid this terrifying, scary thing. You have to have a program designed to effectively transition students away from this risk. So you have to have an effective, long-term, successful anti-smoking program to go along with your scare tactics. Now, you can do it. It's very hard and very expensive. But back then, they didn't know the correct way to do it. They thought all you had to do was scare a bunch of fifth graders. And so ultimately what they did was they didn't realize that if you lie during drug education, you don't cause drug use to go down. You cause it to go up. Lying during drug education causes drug use to go up. And so ultimately, they didn't know that. So what they would do is just sit around trying to think up scary things to say. Now, remember, I didn't even get drug education when I was in school, and I must have heard this at least 500 times. I heard them, if they used to say stuff like this, they'd be like, if you do drugs, you're going to have babies that look like lizards. They always threaten us with lizard babies. And think about that for just a second, okay? Imagine going into a classroom full of fifth graders and saying this, if you guys do drugs, you're going to have babies that look like lizards. Half the class is like, that's the coolest thing you've ever said. They're literally drug cheerleaders at this point. They're out there for the SUV, getting in the SUV and carpool. They're like, mom, dad, smoke some dope. Let's get that lizard in the oven. I want a little brother I can take the part and catch flies with. Ultimately, you've got a bunch of fifth grade, mommy, daddy, smoke that joint with their little marijuana leaf pom-poms going back and forth. You've created a bunch of drug cheerleaders. And here's the problem. You did it because you were lying. And here's the other problem. Once they figure out you were lying, they're going to completely and utterly distrust everything you've said, which preceded that lie. Basically, if you tell people 10 things, one of them is a lie and nine of them are true and useful, the other nine become useless because you have proven yourself to be untrustworthy. And so ultimately, this will be the conclusion for today. If you have us in class, okay, and hopefully you'll see us in the coming years, if you ever have Kelly or myself in class, we're never going to lie to you. We can't. It's unethical, it's ineffective, and it's completely amoral to come in and know that you're doing harm to people by misleading them. I will never tell you something in my class unless there's a scientific study to back it up, preferably two or three. And I will not tell you a story because I like the way it sounds, and I like to think that it can manipulate you into behaving the way I want you to rather than the way you choose to behave. We're here for one reason and one reason only, to give you important trustworthy information about substance use issues that allow you to make informed choices in your own life. So with that, we'll call it a day. We have more to present to you, but we are out of time. Hopefully you had an enjoyable time today or at least learned something valuable. But remember, who am I? What do I want? How am I going to get that job done? Those are the things you have to ponder now or else as you go to a party in high school, you'll be the victim of the moment. Thank you ever so much, you guys. I'm going to call it quits for today. I hope to see you again in the future. I look forward to that. And if not, have a nice life. Take care, you guys.